All right, okay. thank you, thank you, Guzhong. Okay, let's talk about Kafka at RMB. Actually, RMB is one of the earliest adopters uh, of Kafka. Actually, we started to use Kafka things, uh, Kafka 0 0.6, maybe 0 0.7 in production, right? Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, we're still evolving, I think. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some uh, three topics. The first one is uh, some, uh, we're going to share some basic uh, Kafka information and uh, deployment at Airbnb. And then we're going to dive into two systems we build at Airbnb. One is called SpellTap. Basically, it's our change data capture service we use at Airbnb. We use SpellTap to power a lot of services at Airbnb. And then we're going to talk about the Muscle, which is an uh, offline to online data store we use at Airbnb. So, uh, okay, this is our scale. So actually, I think Airbnb has one of the largest uh, Kafka deployments on top of uh, AWS. Uh, we're having more than 10 Kafka clusters. Uh, we spin up dedicated, services, uh, dedicated Kafka cluster for different user cases. And they are on 0 0.11 right now. Currently, we are also testing the latest version of Kafka in our testing cluster. Hopefully, we can use it maybe next month. <laughs> and then we are having over 500 uh, of brokers in total. Uh, um, so most of clusters are using D2 uh, instance type. And for some uh, um, high throughput, high uh, fun out clusters, we are using I3. They, are having, uh, they have uh, you know, uh, SSDs and higher network bandwidth. And we are having more than 3,000 uh, topics while you know, uh, handling over petabytes, petabytes of data per day. Uh, this is our high-level architecture uh, you know, at Airbnb. So we have a lot of uh, applications talking to uh, Kafka clusters directly. They are using uh, you know, Kafka clients. And then we're also having uh, you know, Airbnb use Ruby. And we build our own REST proxy to support Ruby uh, and other languages uh, at Airbnb. And uh, we are also supporting uh, you know, offline jobs and batching jobs to send data to Kafka. And then we have, you know, we're using uh, Spark Streaming and uh, Apache Flink to send the data from Kafka to uh, Data Warehouse. And then, of course, we have lots of applications uh, consuming data from Kafka clusters directly. Uh, actually, uh, Kafka is one of the most important uh, infrastructure at Airbnb. It supports uh, lots of user cases. And then next, we are going to, you know, dive into the SpellTap system. Uh, I will hand it to Zofei to talk about SpellTap. You can use this to... All right, thanks, Hugh. Uh, my name is Zofei, and I'm working uh, at Airbnb's storage team. So uh, SpellTap is our change data capture system. Uh, it's one of the uh, important, most important system uh, uh, use the Kafka. So uh, then first, let me uh, talk about the motivation why we need the uh, spell tab as the change data capture system. So as you know, Airbnb is a travel company. Uh, if you go to Airbnb's website and let's say you are going to travel to New York, first you're going to search uh, New York and it'll show you the uh, rooms and experiences on Airbnb. So uh, these search results are powered by our search team. So it is very important to keep the search result up to date and as you know, the host may update their listings at any time, and maybe one of the listings may be booked at any time. So we don't want to show the outdated result in, in the search page. That's why uh, we want to keep the search index up to date. And as the, the source of the events, uh, like let's say the host update the listing, is less in the database. So we, we are thinking that why not we capture the, these changes in the database level? So uh, when we were designing this system, uh, we, came, we came in with this for uh, several requirements. So first, the uh, change data capture system must be lossless. We cannot tolerate any uh, data loss. So uh, in, in Spinal Tab, we guarantee at least one's delivery. And you know, this, right now, almost every, every system uh, should be scaled horizontally. And you know, we, 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 uh, we keep adding new databases the data sets, the, uh, the traffic keeps growing. So it's very important to keep the system horizontally shutting. And so 
the uh, another uh, requirement is uh, th this system, the change data capture system, must be uh, performant because uh, we want to keep the search index uh, up up to date at minimum uh, lag. So the system must be low, low latency and high throughput. And also we must guarantee the order. Uh, so in, you know, in Kafka, we guarantee the order. Uh, Kafka guarantees the order of the publish, uh, but in spinal tap, we, we guarantee the order uh, by the primary key of the database. And also, of course, the, the system must be uh, fault tolerant and should be highly available. And last feature is uh, we must make sure that this is a general purpose, uh, change their capture system. We, although we are using Kafka and MySQL in Airbnb, we don't want to uh, tightly couple with these two systems. We want to build a general purpose one, change the capture system, and we can easily extend to other, other uh, databases or mess messenger queues. So this is a general uh, workflow of a spinal tap. So we capture the uh, events from data store and we're using a stream client. Uh, in terms of MySQL, we are using open source library called MySQL Binot Connector. That library will give us uh, all the events of the table level. And then those events are propagated to spinal tab. And finally, spinal tab will convert these um, events to mutation. And then we publish to Kafka. And then other services uh, who are interested in those mutations, they can just consume those Kafka topics and then they will get the uh, notification. So, as I said, we want to build a general purpose uh, change the capture system. So we built some abstraction layer on top of uh, our spinal tap. So source is what we call it. That the first ab abstraction layer, layer is the source. The source is responsible to capture the changes on a database level. As I said, we use some stream client to uh, read from change log. In, uh, for example, the uh, MySQL, we have bin log and we, we got these events and we pass it to the source. And in the source, we do some processing. First, we want to filter out the uh, events uh, as we only care about the insert delete updates, loads and mutations from database. And then we, we have a table filter. Table filter is responsible to filter the uh, tables we don't want, we don't need the mutations. And then we, for, last, we have duplicate filters uh, to filter the duplicate events. And uh, after that, we uh, pass this uh, event to a couple of mappers. So we map uh, the events into different types of uh, mutations, like insert, delete, update. We have different uh, structures. And also, we, we need to add the uh, metadata and the table schema. So in this stage, we, we got the mutations. But Getting the mutations is easy, but capturing the uh, schema change is uh, kind of tricky. Because uh, for MySQL case, uh, prior to MySQL 8.0, it's not possible to add this table schema information to the bin log. And as you know, spell tab processing the bin log, reading from bin log, but there's no table schema version, uh, information. So we have to get the table schema information from somewhere. We can query the info, information schema table to get a table schema, but that's the latest one. We don't know the history. We don't know the uh, previous versions of the table schema. So what we do here is uh, we maintain a schema database. So that's a separate MySQL database. And first, we uh, before spinal tab connects to, to the uh, MySQL database, that's our source, we just do a snapshot of all the tables the table schemas. So we create a bunch of uh, empty tables in this schema database. And after that, whenever we see a DDL in the uh, bin log, we just apply that the, the DDL into our schema database. So at this stage, this schema database will have the same schema. All the tables uh, will have the same schema as uh, MySQL database. And after that, we just read the, read the table schema and we propagate it to, we save it to a schema store. So, so spell time we always query the schema store to get the, uh, uh, to get the schema of current offset, bin log offset. So this is how we handle the uh, schema, uh, schema evolution. So 
destination is another abstraction layer of spinal tap. So one, we, we got a source. Uh, we got a, from source, we get the mutations. So now it's time to publish into the Kafka. And in, in Airbnb, we use uh, Thrift as the uh, uh, Kafka schema, message schema. So we have to convert it to our standardized uh, Thrift mutations format. And also the extension is responsible to, uh, to get the last mutation we published, like, successfully published to Kafka. So now we know like, to which bin log offset we have published uh, successfully to Kafka. And we, di we did some uh, optimization of uh, destination. So instead of uh, like we directly published to Kafka, we use the uh, producer consumer pattern and we, uh, we use a bounded blocking queue. So we have a thread which takes the uh, mutation from the source, but then we put the mutation into the, uh, uh, the, the queue. So we have, then we have another thread which takes the mutation out of the queue and then publish to the Kafka. So in this, in this way, we can, uh, we can maintain a low latency. And we also can further optimize it because we only guarantee the order by the primary key. So before we put the uh, mutation into uh, several buffers, uh, several queues, we have a key provider which will uh, do the hashing and then uh, just guarantee the, the, same, the, the uh, same primary key will be uh, in, the, in the same queue. So in this way, we can have multiple threads of uh, Kafka producers and further Im improve the uh, throughput. So we have, uh, that, just as I mentioned, we have source and destination that will uh, constitute a, a pipe. We call it pipe. So pipe is another abstraction. Pipe includes the uh, source and destination. So what does pipe do here? Pipe is responsible for opening the source and a destination also close whenever there's a, uh, let's say whenever there's a, a Kafka issue, we cannot produce to Kafka. So the pipe will, uh, the destination will notify the pipe. Okay, I'm not able to produce to Kafka and then pipe will just close the source. So make sure we, we're not consuming from uh, the source anymore. And also the pipe is uh, responsible for to uh, checkpointing. So we have to keep checkpointing where we are, uh, how far we have consumed from the MySQL bin log. So it just periodically do checkpointing to the zookeeper. So next time when, when the pipe comes up again, they read the last checkpoint that, uh, from zookeeper. So we know where to consume from the uh, last checkpoint. So the pipe is the uh, minimum parallelism uh, unit in a uh, spinal tap. So each pipe corresponds to a database, actually. Uh, so we have multiple databases, so we have multiple pipes. And that's why we need a pipe manager. The pipe manager will manage the pipes. We can, it's easy to config. Uh, when, whenever we add a new database to spinal tap, the pipe manager will create a new pipe, or we will delete the delete and pipe. So now it's time to talk about the scalability. And we are using the uh, framework called Apache uh, Helix. So it is a cluster management framework which will handle the uh, failover and the uh, resource management. So in Helix, uh, there's a concept called resource. So we just map each spinal tap source or pipe into a Helix resource. So whenever uh, we, we add a new pipe, add a new uh, source to spinal tap. The, uh, we just essentially adding a new uh, Helix resource and the cluster management manager will just create a, that resource in Helix and will assign a leader and for that resource. So, so in this way we can uh, achieve the high availability and we are using the leader standby mode and there's always a leader uh, which is processing running a spinal tap pipe, and the, if that leader is down, and uh, Helix will handle the failover, it'll elect a new leader for this uh, source. So uh, we're also using a 
consumer side, right, fancy. So let me explain it a little bit about this. So each uh, spinal tap pipe will have a little epoch. So initially it will be uh, zero or one, I don't remember. So once we, there's a, there's a failover by the helix, we just incre increment this leader, leader epoch. So the new leader will have a different leader epoch. So in this way, the client side, when they see a new leader epoch, okay, so they, the client will know, okay, there's, there's a failover happen, so we should not consume, uh, we should not cons uh, continue to consume the older epoch. So in this way, in case there are multiple leaders, there are multiple uh, leaders producing to uh, spinal tap from client side, we can filter them out. So uh, these are the guarantees, uh, the spinal tap. And like I said, we only guarantee, uh, we guarantee uh, at least once delivery and the event ordering is by primary key. And right now we support MySQL and DynamoDB as a source and we support Kafka, of course, and uh, also Kinesis as the destination. And this is the, let's, let's talk about the use case of spinal tap being Airbnb. This is a very classic one, it's uh, the, the cache invalidation. So the service writes uh, data to database, and also uh, there's another service called cache invalidation We'll just listen to spinal tap, and when, whenever it reads the update uh, or delete event, it will just invalidate. This is an invalidation request to the cache, so the cache will be in invalidated asynchronously. Another use case is, uh, uh, like I said, the search indexing. So the search indexing, uh, we there's a search indexing service uh, which listens to uh, spinal tap, and then. Uh, Read, read the, gather the necessary information from other services maybe, and then just update the index uh, document. We use, uh, uh, I think Airbnb, we use, uh, uh, some services they use Elasticsearch and some are using the same. Uh, so the last part is the validation. Uh, so how do we validate? How do we make sure the spell have published to Kafka all the mutations, all the table mutations correctly? So in my SQL case, because we have bin log files, so we have a, we create an, a validation service which will continuously download the bin log files from my SQL, and then that validation service also consume from the topics, the Kafka topics uh, Spinal Tab published to. So after, after they get all the mutations for that uh, bin log file, it will start validation. It will just compare all the mutations it receives from the Kafka and the uh, bin log, the, all the events from the bin log file. And last is uh, spinal tap core part is open source, and we also have a blog uh, explaining uh, how spinal tap was designed and implemented. So if you're interested, you can just uh, Google search like Airbnb spinal tap. And I will handle to Chen Chen. Uh, he will talk about the muscle or key value store. Cool, thanks, Sophie. So, hi guys, I'm Chen Chen. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the, the muscle. It's our offline to online key value store at Airbnb that we use to support a lot of the data-driven product. So the first question is the, why we need this the key value store? Because I think everybody knows that in the industry we have a lot of the key value stores that like, why we need to build it by ourselves. So there are a bunch of the tenants that we need to think about. The, the major thing is about the bulk loading, that it will want to make it really reliable without side effect, and also it should be integrated with our internal data warehouse pretty smoothly. And for the performance, we want to get the low latency and a high throughput. So how high is the for the throughput? So far, we for the single cluster that we support the million, uh, million QPS level traffic for, for, for the read, and for the write, it's around the uh, 500, 500k QPS per single cluster. And by the way, we have like a several clusters uh, in, the, in the different magnitude. And in order, this is where we want to leverage the Kafka to get it like in, in ordering guarantees whenever there is a, a lot of a mutation events come in to, the, to our storage. I will illustrate the architecture in the next slide. The lossless 
is for the at least the once delivery. Um, for for the de details and why we need that, I will also mention that later. Eventual consistency is something that we trade we trade off for. Uh, for our cases, for Airbnb, we have we have a two kinds of systems. One is online storage system. Uh, another system I, I wouldn't just mention a lot. For this case, this is a derived data storage engine. Like you have a lot of data that you store in your data warehouse, or like you act at least they have some backup in your data warehouse, no matter if it's a Hive or if an EMR, whatever. But you can, you at least have a source of truth, not just in your storage engine directly, but, it also, but it's in your, um, in your uh, offline data warehouse. So in this case, our products can tolerate um, some uh, different level of the mutation lags so that, uh, that we can use this uh, mutation event via the Kafka and to popular the data. And all the, all the products can tolerate the eventual consistency. And scalable, this is uh, definitely something that we want, and for tolerant, for the different replication set and uh, highly available. So this is a muscle architecture. So um, I, I think one, one thing I want to mention is for uh, our exploration about some, some of the key value store in the industry, um, like the Cassandra, and HBase, and also RocksDB. So uh, there, some of the major concerns is like, for the Cassandra and uh, RocksDB, that we uh, did a lot of the homework and some uh, load tests, and what we found is like, for the bulk loading, that uh, either of them are not, not supporting pretty well with our uh, internal offline data warehouse. That is a, kind of a major reason that we want to build that by, by ourselves, that I will mention for the architecture later. Another thing is for the expertise. Um, I think if, if you just want to build something very fancy and using this uh, technology, I think that is uh, totally doable. But for the company-wise, that we want to leverage the, the most expertise that we have, which is the HBase back to the three years ago, that a lot of um, our engineers in the infrastructure team are very good at the HBase and its ecosystems. So that's why we want to choose the, uh, the internal data structure from HBase, which is the, called the H region, as our key value store. But we also explore uh, the Rocks DB, uh, which, which is written uh, in C++. And it, it had, uh, we don't have a lot of expertise on, on Rocks DB um, deployed on the production in Airbnb. So that's why we have some. Uh, we just hold off a little bit, but we know that um, RocksDB could have some better read and write throughput and latency compared with the H region. So that is something that we can explore um, next year. For the architecture, there are several major components that it's uh, worth mentioning about. First thing is the uh, muscle dispatcher, uh, which is the kind of like a gateway and to consolidate all the requests, no matter if it's a read and write, and then it will, it will have some uh, building features like the back pressure and also the quota management to, um, to guard against the, all the storage node. So in case this data, uh, database storage engine wouldn't be flushed a lot. And then for the right events or like a mutation uh, uh, sequence, we will just write to the Kafka. Uh, basically for Muscle, we use Kafka as the distributed bin log if you think if you're uh, if you have a lot of knowledge about the my, how MySQL cluster works between the master and the replica, this is a pretty similar. The uh, the concept is pretty similar. Like we use a Kafka to as the bin log. So for all the muscle store storage nodes, they can consume from from those Kafka and to uh, given this ordering guarantees, then for for each partition, then each shard in the storage node can just uh, consume the data from the Kafka and try to apply to the, uh, to the appropriate um, tables and the partitions um, well. And then there is a cluster controller. This is something that we leverage by the Helix. I think it's what I also mentioned a little bit about that part. Um, it gives us a lot of the, um, you know, like, like the benefits instead of building some Zookeeper clients just on top of Zookeeper. So that's how we leverage the uh, state transition and also some state management in the cluster controller for, for how to 
uh, map the dispatcher to the instances in the storage nodes. For the client side, uh, basically, you know, there's an online, online client, a client service, and an offline uh, data warehouse. Uh, the major thing is for the offline, um, I will try to mention about it later, but here the, the principle is whenever uh, given the offline data, we can first generate the H files, which is the format used by the H region. For the RocksDB, you can use the SS table, um, but, but I mean the idea is the same. Uh, use the um, SLM um, uh, uh, data structure uh, to format this file. And then we will just upload this, data, uh, this H files into the S3 for the backup. And after that, we will just send out some node, uh, load events through the dispatcher and via the Kafka to the storage node finally. Then the storage node will be notified to say, this is, a, this is the time I need to download the H files from S3 into the, into the node. And for the, uh, after the download is finished, the switch is atomic operations that you will directly either override or like a, uh, like a merge the data together. So basically for the sharding part, uh, for the bulk load, uh, what it would do is, uh, is a MapReduce job that we just build using the cascading, uh, Apache cascading uh, framework to do that. And the, here the, uh, the point is like you should control your, your shard numbers because this is a critical when we use the uh, use, a, use a Kafka and we set up a fixed set of the partitions, how you can just map your shards into the Kafka partitions. And also for the, each storage node, it will need to know which partition it needs to consume from. So given this, given this diagram that uh, I think the idea is, a, is, a very, is very simple. It's like when the, given each reducer, after we generate the H file, then we upload it into S3. And then for each dispatcher, when we, when we receive the load file event, notify, um, produce that event into the Kafka and for the storage node to consume that event. And based on the information uh, fetched from the cluster controller, and then you will know for each partition, what kind of the Kafka partition that you need to consume from. For the sharding for the real-time mutations, uh, this is uh, using the same uh, sharding algorithm uh, with the uh, bulk loading that I mentioned in, on the last uh, slide. But actually for this uh, um, real-time uh, re real write, then you will directly write it to the uh, dispatcher gateway. And for that gateway, we will know, okay, for each mutation event, you, you will know which partition that you need to send to. I mean, the partition is the Kafka partition you will know which one to send to. And then the similar way that a storage node will know which partition, uh, Kafka partition that it needs to consume from. The query data, uh, very, very similarly. So you have, so we use the uh, exactly same uh, sharding algorithm for each uh, request, read request, and to read from the dispatcher. But, uh, but here we don't need to rely on any Kafka because Let's say if you have a master and a slave, then you only use the Kafka as the bin logs, right? So that means that only applies to the write cases, not for the read. And for the performance issues for each dispatcher, it will try to regroup the, the, the order request because the each request is the batch request that we support. And you could just regroup them into the different, uh, uh, group by the Kafka partitions. And, and, and also for the storage, uh, store, sorry, for the Kafka partitions. And then you will send a batch request to the storage node and you will fetch the data um, as, a, as a batch request and then aggregate them at the dispatcher level and then return. And this is the uh, partition rebalancing, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty common in the, all the key value storage. But for our cases, because we use the, um, we use the Kafka, so there is a, a little bit, um, some subtle differences here is like, for Muscle, we design the two different modes interchangeably. So each instance could, could be either the batch mode or the online mode. The difference is like for each batch, uh, each batch, if, if the instance is in batch mode, that means this instance doesn't serve the read traffic, but also, but, but only does the daily backup just for the persistence and also for the major compaction. I think 
if you uh, if if anyone have a uh, heavily um, rely on the H base, you uh, may, maybe you will know like if you want to do some major compaction to improve your performance, um, there needs some uh, dedicated uh, care about it, how the uh, major compaction wouldn't affect your read performance for your cluster. So usually um, we do that on let's say in the midnight for that part, um, but for but for our cases because the batch mode doesn't doesn't support the read traffic. So that means, and also for the right traffic, you have the eventual consistency, depending on the Kafka. There's a, we just need to guarantee some eventual consistency. So it is fine that we can do the major compaction to improve the performance of the batch most instance. And then we'll, for, um, for each day, that we will switch the nodes between the batch and online mode. So that means the, the, batch, the batch mode nodes, for the next day, it's gonna be the online nodes and all the H files has been compacted. So you will, you will just get a, the less H files and then you get a better read performance. And for the, for the current online, uh, online nodes, for the next day, it's gonna become a batch node, a batch model nodes. So you can do some major compaction without, without affecting any read performance. How we do that is the, it's quite simple at this moment. It's like, you can just create a nodes and which is the two X of the batch modes nodes then we will put new nodes in the batch mode and do some, uh, do some provisioning there. Uh, there are two things that we need to do. First the thing is we need to uh, have all the daily snapshot to be downloaded so you will have a, like a baseline, right? And then for the Kafka mutations because we record the offset in our, in our logs and by consuming those uh, offset and you would need to catch up with the Kafka mutations until, until up to date. And after that, we will say this the batch mode no, nodes is, the, is a consistent or like is, a, is up to date with the other nodes. So then you can delete, delete the old groups and repeat for the next groups. For each group here, what I mean is like for the, for the uh, replication set, basically we will have a lot of a replication set so that you can do that. You can do each group uh, at, a, at a time and for uh, many times. We, can, uh, we also just automated that part. Partition resharding uh, is another uh, interesting topic, uh, which is, uh, so why do we need the partition resharding? If you think about a Kafka, it's like, um, if, if there's a hot spotting, that for the rebalancing, it's, a, it's still not enough to make sure that your single shard can support the, let's say, very spike read traffics, like, for example, like the email scheduling or like the search cases at Airbnb. So we will need to do that re, uh, partition resharding. Generally, this is a happen very rarely at, at our scale. And also, maybe it's pretty likely that um, uh, thanks to the well-defined schemas, so we didn't just encounter with this problem a lot. Yeah. And this one is a feasible, but it's expensive because of the heavy operations. Given our architecture, you have to take care of the storage node and Kafka and also for the map, map produce job. So how do we do that? If we must do that, uh, I, so here I just like, give an example. It's like, let's say we currently we have like a shard zero to seven, you have uh, eight shards. And now you wanna just uh, double it to let's say the 16 shards. So then what we do is we will first have a, like a shard eight and, and then you will have a do write, uh, do write the both the batch and the streaming write events into the both the shard zero and shard eight uh, through the dispatcher. So at this moment, you can, uh, we can make sure the shard zero and shard eight has the exactly the same data, right? And for the step B, the dispatcher will try to redirect the read and write um, shard eight data from the shard eight only, because in this case, shard eight already has all the data. But note, note that we have another one is the batch job, which is the set of the different shard there. So for this case, the dispatcher will uh, still routes the same load file request to both the shard zero and the shard eight, so that the both the, both the uh, shard zero and shard eight can just uh, load the data correctly for the uh, I mean for the bulk loading. The step C is the is the double the H file reducer that we mentioned because the reducer, the number of a reducer controls how many H files we will generate it and upload it to the S3. 
From there, and uh, using the same sharding algorithm to map the data, uh, map, map the sharded data into the sharded H file. So then you will have a double your H files uh, in the end. And the step D, so eventually the dispatcher can, okay, at this moment, we are safe to make sure the dispatcher can route the shard A load file request into the shard A only. So shard zero doesn't need to maintain any data from the, uh, which, which, which is supposed to belong to the shard eight, uh, depending on the splitting. So um, here I would like to uh, just uh, give a brief talk about some use cases, real uh, active use cases at Airbnb. One is a user provider, which is used for the uh, search team. Um, for any guest comes into the Airbnb, we will try to just track your history and your, um, like your navigation through the different pages and events. So this is a user provider. How, how, um, what's the architecture is like for each application or like in your um, pages or like a user behaviors? We will just uh, try to emit the events into the Kafka. And then the, uh, the Kafka uh, internally will, will have uh, two streams. One is the uh, direct stream to the Flink. Another one is a, is a stream to the data warehouse. And for each day, the data warehouse team will just uh, generate the, uh, the, the, the daily snapshot for that Kafka events. And then for the Flink, um, the, so our user provider team provides the two things. One is uh, using the Flink streaming, um, uh, streaming programming mode and to just uh, uh, ingest the data directed from the Kafka and load them and do some transformation. It's kind of like an ETL and then write to the Kafka directory. Uh, another way is they use the Flink, the batch mode to read the data from the data warehouse and then they just generate the batch H, file, uh, H, H files, um, which is a little bit different than what we do for the MapReduce. And then they just put that in the muscle. But here they just uh, create a separate muscle tables. For example, let's say you can have a user profiler uh, real time table and you can have another real uh, user profiler batch table. And so there are two tables stored in the muscle. And for the online serving side, for the user profiler service, they will just try to read and aggregate the data on the application side. Uh, one example is for each user, you will have a different events, right? For events, you just uh, flush into the, uh, into the LSM uh, file, like the H files, and when you read them, you can just uh, given given the range of the timestamp, then you we, you can just uh, fetch uh, multiple versions of uh, one users. Given if you define the uh, each version is uh, each event of this users, and then you can do whatever aggregation that you want in the application side. Another case uh, which is uh, also. Uh, similar architecture, but it's interesting part is for the machine learning feature engineering platforms, what they are doing. So what they are doing is they have a feature set declaration API and they use to uh, allow any client teams to uh, do some configuration and to set up to say, hey, I want to create some, another different feature set. And after that, they have a pipeline to automatically build up the feature set streaming, which uses the Flink as the uh, underlying um, parallel computing um, uh, platform. And another case is using the feature set, uh, feature set batch, which uses the Spark uh, for, our, for their batch uploading. And then both of them will just uh, uh, try either stream or either batch load into the muscle, uh, given, a, uh, given the approaches that I mentioned before. In this, and, but, they, but that team, they also create a separate muscle tables in muscle so that in their feature fetchers, they can just uh, do either multi-version multi aggregation or like a multi-version um, uh, some counting or like a different, uh, different aggregation approaches, they can do that there. And the application, the, and that layer is abstracted so that all the applications, like what we have is the, for the trust cases, if you wanna do some fraud detection, they, they don't know what's the underlying storage engine. They only know there is a feature fetcher that they can use to directly fetch the data from the underlying data storage, but they don't know what kind of a storage it is. So that's how we try to abstract it as much as possible for between the client team and for the machine learning infra team and our storage team. 
So that is a, a two use cases that we have. Yeah, I think that's the, uh, the, all the things that we want to mention. And if anyone has any questions? Any questions? Do we want to come together? Um, okay. Uh, okay. Let, let me ask one question about uh, the first uh, system that you have, you guys have been built for schema evaluation. So it seems like you are basically trying to capture any schema changes in real time and basically do the you know schema changes in your store immediately. Does that actually rely on your bin log to be totally ordered and you only have a single reader from the bin log? Yes. Yes. We do have a single reader for the bin log. And how how? impact your performance because if you have a single log and your bin log is expanding rapidly and in order to really capture the schema changes along with data uh, pushes as well you have to basically follow this order. Uh, are you asking like the, the single thread bin log reader will affect the performance? Yeah, yeah. Uh, right now uh, I think our uh, QPS is okay and we haven't seen like very significant issue of like single bin log reader because uh, I think for the, uh, for the client, for the uh, MySQL bin log connector that client, it just to try to uh, mimic the uh, behavior of a MySQL replica. So that's why uh, keeping, like, keeping it as a single thread will make things easy and we don't have to worry about the multi-thread contentions. So uh, for now, we just keep using that, this uh, client that, we, that default is like single thread. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Cool, let's thank our MBMB folks again. And uh, that wraps up our, our last talk. And uh, again, a final note that the next month, we're going to have our fourth Kafka meetup in our Mountain View office. So, and uh, we'll have you know, new talks and also from other folks from uh, potentially uh, Dropbox and the Netflix. So stay tuned and uh, welcome to join our next meetup as well. Thank you.